hello guys so welcome back to my channel so today we're going to be reacting to anti-slave anti-slavery patrols the west africa squadron west africa i'm from west africa nigeria to be precise so let's check it out and see what this one is about needless to say by the title this is necessarily going to be something of a sensitive topic so, please understand that this is not in any way a commentary on the politics or morality of the slave trade that preceded the period we are going to discuss, nor is it an attempt to justify anything from any nation beyond the scope of the history being discussed here. This is purely an account of the facts of the matter in their context. Right, now that disclaimer is done, let's look at the main subject at hand. To put some context to it, the slave trade from Africa to the Americas had been going on for several hundred years by the start of the 19th century. For a long period, this had been part of the so-called triangular trade, wherein various processed goods and weapons were traded from Europe to Africa, where they were exchanged with a variety of foreign and local slave traders for slaves, who were then shipped to the Americas in exchange for raw materials like sugar and silver which were then taken back to Europe for processing into finished goods. Practically every European nation with ships that floated was either taking part in or had taken part in this trade, since it brought in vast amounts of money. By the start of the 19th century, Europe was neck deep in the Napoleonic Wars, which at various times amounted to the British Empire against Europe, and at others involved Britain subsidising various nations such as Austria and Prussia against Napoleon. The British Empire was in a somewhat hypocritical position when it came to slavery. Due to the fact that most other nations were at war with the Empire, and the Royal Navy controlled the seas, most slavers were flying British flags. However, slavery in England had been banned hundreds of years before in 1102, with periodic court cases reaffirming this through the centuries. But as the slave trade picked up in the 1700s, it became more and more common to see slaves in the streets of English cities under the questionable argument that they had been enslaved elsewhere and so English laws did not apply to their status. However, a case brought by an escaped slave named James Somerset in 1722 resulted in the follow following pronouncement from Judge Mansfield. The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced for any reason, moral or political, but only by positive law, which preserves its force long after the reasons, occasions and time itself from whence it was created is erased from memory. It is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. Whatever inconveniences, therefore, may follow from a decision, I cannot say that this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, and therefore the black must be discharged. What this was effectively saying, translated into normal English, was that slavery was so repulsive a concept that there was no argument that could be made to support the keeping of slaves under English law unless a specific law had been passed that explicitly permitted it. This was widely interpreted to mean that slavery was once more firmly illegal in England. However, the positive law mentioned, i.e. a direct law specifically enabling slavery, existed in many British colonies, although not all, since these colonies had a degree of freedom to write their own law apart from that of the home country. So, you can see the hypocritical position here of slavery being considered completely repulsive on English soil, but vast numbers of slaves being transported under the flag of the British Empire. This case, and others, drove and enlarged the existing abolitionist movement in the country, opposed, of course, by the merchants and plantation owners who were making a massive profit from the slaves held in various colonies. Arguments would rage back and forth, but by 1807 the Slave Trade Act was passed, abolishing the slave trade throughout the British Empire. Although it did not free those who were already enslaved, it was supposed to stop the flow of new slaves with fines for any ship caught with slaves aboard, with the ultimate objective of ending slavery by simple fact of the lack of supply of new material. 
This brings us to the start of the anti-slavery patrols, as the next year, despite the war still pressing hard on the Royal Navy's commitments, two ships were sent to form the West Africa Squadron, the 32-gun fifth-rate HMS Sol Bay and the smaller HMS Derwent. These two ships would then chase, stop, and search ships, and if the ships were found with slaves aboard, or equipped for slaving, the ships were seized, any slaves freed, and fines imposed. Unfortunately, this led to many slavers, seeing a full-fledged warship bearing down on them, deciding to throw their human cargo overboard purely to reduce the fines they knew they were going to get. As a result, the Slave Trade Felony Act was passed in 1811 that also made it a felony offence to engage in the slave trade, which meant that it didn't matter how many slaves you had on board when you were captured. Apart from the fines, the ship's captain and its owners were also going to be in trouble. Slavers tried a number of other tactics to evade the Royal Navy. Of course, they could no longer fly a British flag, so they tried to fly the flags of other countries. But in this case, the Napoleonic Wars worked against them, since Britain was at war with practically everyone anyway, and between 1812 and 1815 that included the United States. So almost any ship not flying the Union Jack would be seized regardless, and with intense diplomatic pressure being exerted on Portugal, a rare British ally, this allowed the Royal Navy to search and seize their slavers as well. As the Napoleonic Wars came to an end, the British actually forced the defeated nations to sign up to the eventual abolition of the slave trade as part of the peace conditions, which allowed the navy to keep chasing down foreign flagged ships, even if the empire wasn't at war with their home nations anymore. The number of ships was also increased, although six ships covering 3,000 miles of coast was still small. The terms of the treaties restricted the Navy's potential action somewhat, but slavers were beginning to recognise that no flag of convenience was likely to keep them safe for long, especially as the United States began to send a few ships to help out what was now called the Preventative Squadron, starting in the 1820s. So instead, slave ships became smaller and faster, trying to simply outrun the warships. In return, the British would send newer and faster warships, and began to use the fastest captured slave ships as auxiliary warships. One of them, renamed with typical British humour as HMS Black Joke, was especially successful. The 1833 Slavery Abolition Act had abolished slavery completely in the British Empire, and this, along with the fact that the empire's military and economic might was beginning to pull even further ahead of other nations, thanks in part to the Industrial Revolution, saw the squadron expand to around 25 ships, regularly having to be swapped out because of the high incidence of tropical disease. And this squadron would include various steamships that made further mockery of the sail-powered slave ships' attempts to evade them. This newfound power also saw more pressure being exerted, with various local chiefs and kings being pressured into signing anti-slavery treaties by dint of the Royal Navy showing up with a heavily armed warship, and the Royal Navy's officers, sometimes in direct contravention of their orders, decided that they would board and capture any slaver they came across, regardless of whatever flag they flew which led to a fairly large number of diplomatic incidents, but which didn't seem to deter the Navy officers, who were several months away from any real communication with London. The 1840s saw a further escalation, with new laws treating most slave ships captured as pirates, and a number of military expeditions being mounted to destroy slaving centres on the African coast, and depose or even kill remaining local kings and chiefs who had refused to end slavery in their territory. This highly aggressive approach had results, but briefly caused a major uproar in parts of the United States, which was mitigated by the Webster-Ashburton Treaty in 1842, which formalised the US Navy's contribution to the anti-slavery efforts. Various efforts by certain political pressure groups were still being made to stop the West Africa Squadron's activities for a number of less than honourable reasons, but the government was able to resist them and the patrols would continue. 
particular note in this period should be made of the actions of Joseph Denman, commander of the Northern Division of the squadron, who went on an absolutely ruthless and systematic campaign along the African coast, burning so-called slaving factories to the ground and openly daring anyone who objected to try and stop him. After his actions were challenged by foreign governments and Parliament initially tried to put a stop to his action, Denman returned home and argued his case with enough force that by 1848 the Royal Navy was handed active permission and encouragement to raise every last slave factory they could find to the ground and full authority to stop any ship of any flag that was thought to be a slaver with a guarantee with no censure from the government. Somewhat unsurprisingly, unleashing the most powerful navy on the planet with carte blanche to exterminate slavers on sight saw a dramatic and sudden collapse in slaver numbers in the late 1840s and early 1850s. By the time of the American Civil War in 1861, when President Lincoln formally agreed to, uh, that American ships could be searched, he was acknowledging in law what had at that point been operational reality for over a decade, and the slave trade was basically dead on the West African coast. With a lot last court case against a captured slaver being held in 1866, and the courts themse themselves being dissolved in 1871, the Freetown Court, for example, having only seen seven cases since the mid-1840s. Over the course of its active lifetime, the ships of the squadron would capture over 1,600 proven slave ships and free approximately 150,000 Africans, at the cost to the Royal Navy of a casualty rate over five times higher than any other posting, mostly due to disease. The Royal Navy would then go on to target slave trades in other parts of the world, such as the Indian Ocean, applying the lessons of the West Africa Squadron in a mixture of local corporation, fast ships, and overwhelming firepower to bring those trades to an end as well. Although British involvement in the slave trade prior to 1807 cannot be denied, or its effects diminished, it is also a fact that the Royal Navy was pretty much the only force in the world in the 19th century with the numbers, drive, willingness, firepower, and capability to curtail the global slave trade, and that without these efforts, many more would no doubt have been taken to slave plantations and other such destinations during the 19th and possibly even into the 20th centuries. As it must be remembered that a great many European powers would only begrudgingly commit to ending the slave trade when the other option was continuous war with the British Empire. And of course, a special credit has to go to those Royal Navy officers who saw the situation for what it truly was and would do their absolute level best to stop it, regardless of treaties or other political considerations, eventually forcing the British Parliament to catch up with their own morality. In the words of historian William Leakey, the unweary, unostentatious and inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as among the three or four perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. We can only wish that this had come sooner. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. This is very, this is very interesting to watch videos like this or history like this are not common. I wish more people are exposed to this. Like, and the UK ought to be proud of themselves. This is a great achievement. And this is actually the first time I'm coming across this. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section. Were you aware of this? Have you been, um, have you been exposed to this knowledge before now? Or when were you exposed to it? I would love to know, hear what your your thoughts are in the comment section. Let me know what your thoughts are and take care of yourself. Be you, do you, but do not conform, guys. Till I come here next time. Bye.